Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Blue Planet Week 2. Um, so happy Wednesday, everybody. Um, I don't know about for y'all, but it is raining out here. Um, so hopefully we'll have wonderful internet. Uh, I've never had internet problems here, so it should be good. Um, but I see some new names and some of the names that we have been seeing all week. So thank you all for joining us. Hi, everybody, Ryan, Sadie, Sean and Tobin, Daly, Laura, Connor. Hi, guys. Hope you are all doing super well on this Wednesday. Um, so we are going to be talking about ocean engineering today. We talked um, about biological oceanography yesterday. And in our biological oceanography, we got to learn about lots of different things. Um, and one of the things that we got to talk about was some plankton. Um, and we also heard from Dr. Hample and she came and talked about some shipwrecks and stuff. So, um, or microbiomes that live on uh, shipwrecks, microbes. So um, I think we have a poll question for you to just kind of recap and talk about um, what we talked about yesterday. So we'll have a quick review really quick. Um, so what is salinity? Salinity is the amount of what in the ocean? Um, so what is salinity? Is it the amount of seaweed, the amount of salt, the amount of animals, or the amount of shrimp in the ocean? The amount of salt, perfect. Yeah, so salinity is gonna be the amount of salt in the ocean and that salt can be um, a number of different types of ions and materials that are gonna be found in the water. So we'll talk more about that tomorrow um, in our chemical oceanography lesson. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you so we can see what's going on for today. Uh, we had some questions about the oil rigs and things yesterday and I just, uh, figured I would explain why I have this picture as the beginning of all of our slides. Um, I kind of feel like it goes into a lot of the uh, different areas of oceanography here um, with oil rigs. When you have oil, um, you're going to be dealing with all of these things because it can impact um, literally any of these things can be impacted um, or impact the oil. So that's why I put this up here. Um, but today we're going to be talking about ocean engineering. So that also kind of has to do with oil rigs and things because um, somebody's got to build those stuff or those things. So um, ocean engineering. So uh, this is a really fun lesson, super fun things to talk about and learn about um, in ocean engineering. So without further ado. So what is engineering? Just kind of starting from the basics, right? So Engineering is a branch of science and technology concerned with the design, building, and use of engines, machines, and structures. Um, so pretty much anything can be engineered, um, and there's tons of different types of engineering as well. Um, so there's civil engineering, there's chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical en engineering, and um, Engineering can be very complicated, but it doesn't have to be complicated. So it can be something as simple as a fork or even as this clip that I'm fiddling with and I just broke by accident in my hand. Um, so somebody had to engineer this, right? It's got springs and um, different parts to it that are going to perform different actions. So um, work done by or as an occupation of an engineer. So this is going to be, um, the engineer themselves, right? They are going to be performing the work um, and unless the structure eventually can operate on its own, right? So, um, or it can also be the action of working artfully to bring something about. So you are um, basically creating a tool that can be used for something or a specific purpose. Um, and so in these different branches of engineering, you have lots of different options of things you could pursue. Um, so if you wanted to work with civil engineering, um, you could be working with um, just like different urban places or um, kind of constructing cities or anything like that. Things that are used in cities, um, roadways, bridges, um, chemical engineering, you're gonna be working with uh, chemicals, right? Or different um, things that are going to be affected by chemicals. Um, mechanical engineering is going to be working with specific tools um, 
that you can design yourself, right? And they will carry out a specific purpose. Um, and then electrical engineering is going to be working with obviously electrical things. Um, so if you had to choose which field of engineering would you like to work in? Um, electrical, chemical, civil, or mechanical? Chemical <laughs> or ocean engineering? <laughs> Let me just stumble over all of those words. You don't have to pick ocean engineering. You don't have to feel pressured to do that. Pick what you would ever, whatever you would really want. I'm gonna take a sip of water since I'm having a hard time talking. Ooh, some variety. Okay, so we have some of you who would like to work in electrical, um, one of you who would like to work in chemical, two are interested in mechanical, and two are interested in ocean engineering. Um, awesome. So ocean engineering is going to kind of combine a lot of these different things together. Um, and that's one of the things that makes it so cool. But let's kind of talk about how ocean engineering came about. Um, and what is it? So it includes the design, development, and operation of vehicles, tools, and technologies, including ocean energy extraction, or um, so that could be things like using the oil from the ocean floor, right, um, or deep within the ocean, and um, natural gases, or it could be anything like working with hydraulics or um, using water to power something. Um, so you're gonna be designing, developing, and operating these vehicles. Um, and that can look like a number of different things. So the first ocean engineering project um, was in 3000 BC at the mouth of the Nile River. Um, and this was an ancient form of engineering. So what they were doing there is they were modifying the river um, and changing kind of the, the directional flow of the water. And um, this was a type of engineering. So more interest has risen in the past decade due to climate change effects and sea level rise concerns. So basically as our earth is changing, people are um, getting more intrigued and more interested in the way that the earth is changing. And so they are trying to design different tools and technologies that we can use to analyze those things. Um, so the things that are happening are coastal flooding and increase in destructive natural disasters and seismic activity. Um, so the more flooding that we're getting, people are trying to figure out how to prevent that flooding or how to um, cope with it. Uh, and then there's also um, increase in destructive natural disasters. So we know we're getting stronger hurricanes now um, and things like that. So people are trying to figure out how they can build things to research the formation of those hurricanes or also um, study the impacts of them once they actually hit seismic activity. So you're talking about like earthquakes um, and any type of um, plate tectonic activity. Uh, so earthquakes or um, like looking at fault lines or um, trenches and stuff like that in the ocean. Um, we've also had some examples of that. So tsunamis, right? So that would be an example of seismic activity. Um, after an underwater earthquake, a tsunami is going to be a large wave that is generated from that um, earthquake. And usually when a tsunami hits, um, so it's very different from like just, you know, a rogue wave or a, a tidal wave. Um, so when a tsunami hits, all the water recedes away from the coastline um, and goes back very, very, very far. And then it will just kind of rush forward very quickly. Um, so there's two events of that listed here, one in 2004 um, in the Indian Ocean and then one um, in Japan in 2011. And then between those, obviously, we had Hurricane Katrina in 2005, um, and that hit the Gulf Coast um, and kind of demonstrated to us just the growth of um, the strengthening of our natural disasters. So the first international conference on coastal engineering was in 1950. Um, so this was kind of like the, the initial formation of people congregating together to talk about engineering in the ocean. And uh, it was rather small. So there was less than 100 people there and it was in Long Beach, California. Um, and so since then, we have 
gotten a lot more participation in that area, right? So by 2006, over a thousand attendees were present at this conference. Um, and arguably at that point, there had been a lot of different advancements um, in the field itself. So technologies and everything had been um, improved a lot at that point. And as well as now in 2020, um, we have come a long way in the realm of building things for the ocean. So just some tools of the trade. What are we gonna be talking about today? What is actually used in ocean engineering? So um, there's a couple different things. So there's autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, these are like underwater gliders. So you have Eagle Rays, um, Mola Molas, and um, a Slocum glider. And these things, we're gonna go into detail later, but um, these guys are going to operate pretty much independently um, and they will be going beneath the surface of the water. So in opposition to that, you have autonomous surface vehicles like sail drones and wave gliders, and those are going to be working at the surface. Um, so they kind of look like a boat uh, that is just not being driven by a human. So <laughs> it's pretty cool. Um, and then you have remotely operated vehicles, which are used very heavily in scientific research. So you have ROV Odysseus with pelagic, um, we have ROV Argo with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, um, who actually that ROV was used in um, discovering the Titanic and just kind of exploring that part of the ocean where the Titanic sank. Um, and Odysseus has actually worked with us before for one of our camps. So we have usually during the summertime, we have a camp called Ocean Science and Technology Camp. Um, where we learn all about these different types of um, ROVs and just pretty much uh, careers that you could pursue in marine science. Um, basically like the real life version of this camp, but um, there's a lot more field work and just kind of exploring that you can do. So we, we go out to Stennis, we go out to different places, we go out on the research vessels. Um, and so Odysseus was used in that camp to get some footage for us from uh, the seafloor. And then some technologies that can be used are things like CTDs, multi-beam sonars, telemetry, and so much more. Um, so CTDs are super cool and very, very useful. They're like multi-purpose, they got so many uses. Um, and so they're mostly going to work with conductivity, temperature, and depth. So that's what it stands for. So let's explore a little bit about our autonomous underwater vehicles, our AUVs. So autonomous um, is going to mean basically that it's going to operate independently. Um, and so these are unmanned and untethered. So untethered just means it's not gonna be connected to the boat or to anything really. Um, and so these are gonna be programmed at the surface and then navigate alone. So they're self-propelled. So you basically um, tell it what to do and then it goes and it does it. Um, so it samples the water column and maps the ocean floor. So it's got um, all of these different accessories that it can use in order to do this. So it's got cameras on it. Um, they have sensors for pH, um, and they can also um, sense the conductivity, the temperature, and the depth, so it's got a CTD on it, um, and dissolved oxygen sensors, so it can tell you the DO of the water or the dissolved oxygen, which is super important for all of our living things. Um, it's got acoustic telemetry and tracking systems, collision avoidance system, obviously very important, right? If it see something in the way, it's going to skirt and move. Um, and it's got, um, yeah, lots of other things. So sonars, um, a current profiler, so it can detect the currents, and then rechargeable batteries, very necessary. Um, and so it knows where it's going, and they basically can program it to um, come back to the ship after they launch it. So they launch it for a certain amount of time and then they do what's um, called calling it home, right? So they call it home and then it returns to the ship based on um, their longitude and latitude, so their coordinates. 
So this can take physical characteristics of the ocean, like the acoustics, um, the CTD stuff that we've talked about, the water quality, um, and it also takes videos and still images. So this would be used for something um, a little less, um, I'm not sure the word I'm looking for, a little less detailed than the ROV. So the ROV is gonna go down and um, look for something in particular and explore a certain area um, and like biological things. So the ROVs can pick up, you know, sediment cores, um, they can pick up samples and return it back up to the boat. Um, so your uh, AUVs are not really going to be retrieving anything for you from the ocean. Um, they're mainly going to be kind of just scanning and analyzing what's happening under there. So your autonomous surface vehicles, um, also unmanned and untethered, so they are not connected to anything and there's nobody on this. There's nobody driving. Um, so they're programmed at the surface as well, navigate alone and they're self-propelled. So um, very, very capable. <laughs> um, so they carry large loads for a longer amount of time than our AUVs. Um, they have longer ranges so they can go farther um, and travel faster. They're able to communicate with a land-based computer and receive relayed instructions. So a lot of times for these, since they can travel farther, the computer will be on land, right? Whereas the AUVs, a lot of time, you'll be out on a research vessel and then launch your AUV and it will come back to your boat. Um, so these can be operated from the shore and um, then just return to the shore when it's called home. Um, so they take pretty much similar data. Um, so physical characteristics, looking at the ocean, um, the water quality, right? They're looking at the ocean floor, they can do mapping. Um, and in recent news, um, the autonomous drone ship, of course, I still love you, successfully retrieved Dragon crew rocket um, and AUV sentry and sail drones in military applications. Um, so it can be used for all of these things as well. So ROVs um, are going to be remotely controlled. So they are going to be operated by a human up on a boat. So it's not considered autonomous, um, even though it is doing the work, um, you are also doing some work, <laughs> just not the direct work. Um, so it's tethered by what's called an umbilical and it has no time constraints. So this um, isn't necessarily going to be battery powered. Um, so these guys are able to cover a wide area of study. So like I said earlier, they can retrieve geological samples, biological samples, um, chemical, anything. Um, and so they can reach super deep depths as well. Um, and these are generally much, much larger. Um, so launching these guys is going to look very, very different than launching your um, AUVs. So your AUVs um, are generally going to be smaller and it's not as involved to get them into the water. Um, but the ROVs are going to be very, very expensive pieces of equipment. And um, you definitely don't want to lose your ROV. So in order to ensure that, um, or one of, that's one of the things they want to ensure of is, is not to lose it. Um, but they also have to consider if anything goes wrong, they have to have all the equipment that they need on the boat and ready to work on the ROV. So um, any type of malfunctions or um, anything like that, they have to be prepared to fix that pronto, especially because um, it costs thousands of dollars to be out on the research vessels in the first place, um, especially if you have, you know, a certain number of days that you are trying to look at certain things, um, certain environmental factors. If you only have a certain window of time where the currents are going to be doing what you need them to do, um, 
or if you have bad weather coming in or anything like that. So um, the ROBs have to be ready and there's gotta be a lot of maintenance done in order to keep them in check. So basically when their ROVs are going to be launched, um, the people that will be controlling them are going to be on the ship and in pretty much like a large metal storage container. Um, so it, it kind of looks like a train car um, just sitting on the boat. And then inside of that, they have just walls of computer screens and um, monitors and everything so that they're able to control um, the robot. And so it's got lots of different cool things that it can do. So it's got two different arms, um, a larger one and a smaller one. Um, and it has different things that allow it to, you know, take water samples if it wants to, um, lights and cameras, and um, it costs millions of dollars to build one of these things to engineer them. Um, the yellow and blue parts that you see here um, are flotation. Um, that's going to help to keep it buoyant in the water so that it's not just falling over onto its side, right? Because if it just fell over, that would not be good. Um, so this is Odysseus, and um, Odysseus is a very, very nice RV. So Pelagic uh, kind of has like a, a different system. So we you're able to rent Odysseus, basically. Um, so you rent the ROV, and it goes on to any research vessel. Um, so it's kind of kind of cool um, because he can cover a lot of different research projects and do a lot of different things. Um, so that's with Pelagic and then there's Argo who helped discover the Titanic wreckage and then there's also Hercules. So Hercules works with the Ocean Exploration Trust um, and is aboard the um, EV Nautilus. So the Nautilus is an exploration vessel so it's that's why it's called EV, um, not RV, because RV is research vessel, um, but this is an exploration vessel. So it's used pretty much to go to the parts of the ocean that nobody has been to before and that we don't know anything about. So Hercules is so large um, that it needs a smaller subsequent ROV to be launched with it. And that ROV is named Argus. So Argus is kind of like an accessory um, ROV that will help Hercules accomplish the tasks that it needs to accomplish. Um, and so he can kind of get into like different spaces and just help um, Hercules operate. So last summer we worked with um, the Nautilus. So one of our, one of my coworkers went out on the Nautilus and was able to um, basically communicate with us, with our campers. Um, and so she did that virtually. And so we were able to get pretty much live ROV footage of Hercules. So if, you, if you're ever interested in seeing some live footage, you can go to the Nautilus website um, and they will have all of this on there and you can just watch Hercules explore the ocean floor, which is super exciting because they can discover lots of different things. Um, last year, I think they came across like hundreds of small um, like octopuses out there. So they were able to just like look at this huge farm colony of octopuses. And then they also had, um, they also discovered a whale fall. So that is super cool. Um, and a whale fall is basically when a whale dies, um, they have very heavy bones and their blubber and their lungs are what keep them afloat. So whenever they die, um, their blubber and their lungs, every, everything breaks down, right? But the bones will just sink down. Um, so they will sink down and um, yeah, things will just feed on it for like a year because they're so big. So they discovered that um, with the Hercules and that is super, super cool. So just some ocean engineering in action. Uh, so this here is the deployment of a CTD aboard the RV Point Sur. So the Point Sur is our um, currently our largest research vessel, soon to be outcompeted by um, a new research vessel that we are building right now. We have an image of that at the end. 
Um, but the CTD has these chambers on it that are going to collect water and that is where their samples are going to come from. So um, let me just play this for you. You can see they're raising it up um, and it's tethered. So they're just gonna drop it down. Well, I say drop it. They're gonna ease it down <laughs> into um, the water and they're gonna go as far down as it can go and that's gonna get the depth. And then this cord um, that you see here, the umbilical, that is pretty much going to um, transmit all of the information. So um, the ship has labs inside of it. So it's got wet labs and then it's got dry labs. Um, and so the wet labs are where you bring, you know, all of your like biological samples and everything that's got water and dirt and muck. Um, and then the dry labs is going to be like where you have all the computer stuff and you can analyze data or um, just view your data. So the um, data is going to come straight to the dry lab while the CTD is still in the water pretty much. It's almost immediate. Um, and so it will immediately graph uh, all of the things that um, the CTD is measuring. So it can measure, you know, the conductivity, the depth, the temperature. So you see all of that on graph um, and it can tell you at what depth was it, what temperature at, you know, and you can see the gradients of um, how the temperature was changing with depth and how the salinity was changing with depth. If you remember from our physical oceanography lesson, your temperature will be generally going down and your salinity will be going up as you go farther down into the ocean um, with depth. So it can also measure like phytoplankton. So we talked about that yesterday. And so it can pretty much measure the primary productivity. So um, you'll know if you're in a very nutrient rich area or if you were in a um, less nutrient rich area. And this is a time lapse retrieval of the ROB Odysseus. So um, this is just kind of showing you how they get um, Odysseus out of the water. Keep in mind, this is a time lapse. So this is a um, long process, much longer. Let's watch it again. And these guys all have on hard hats and everything um, because it can be very um, dangerous to be doing this. So um, life jackets, hard hats, it's all important. So sea perch. Um, so if you think ROBs are just the coolest thing on the planet um, and you would like to make one, there is something called sea perch, um, which is basically like a DIY ROV kit that can be delivered to you. Um, and then you are able to participate in competitions um, with your school or even just, um, you can literally just like get a group of friends together and um, participate in this competition. So basically what happens is you sign up, um, they will deliver you a box that has all of the equipment that you need in order to construct your ROV. Um, and so it's got the propellers that you need and it's got the pool noodles and the PVC and the mesh nets and everything. Um, and then obviously it's got instructions. You don't have to know this already, but their website has tons of resources about how you can um, get a group together, how you can register for the competition and make teams. Um, and so the Marine Education Center usually hosts this um, competition. We host the regional um, challenge. So it's at the Biloxi Natatorium, so in the indoor pool. Um, and when you have your team registered, there's lots of different um, guidelines and rules and things that you can actually apply like different materials to your ROV. Like if you want to make it your own and, um, you know, put whatever you want on it, there's different um, guidelines for that. So each ROV is going to be different. They won't all be exactly the same. And then what's going to happen is they're going to participate in certain obstacles, um, like an obstacle course, right? Uh, so they go through different rings, they have to move stuff, um, and somebody is going to be driving the ROV, right? Someone on your team. And then you can win all the awards. So <laughs> um, it is a very cool 
um, event and I wish I would have done it in high school but I didn't know about it and I don't even know if it was around when I was in high school um, but yeah if you're interested in that just um, go to seaperch.org and then keep in mind that if you are in the Mississippi area we will be hosting um, the Sea Perch Challenge again. Here's a video that I um, made. This is me. Uh, <laughs> so we have um, the materials and things for Sea Perch. So um, one of my coworkers, Riley, worked with um, some of the people from the MRC to um, the Marine Resource Center. I think we'll talk about that later in this um, PowerPoint, or maybe it's later in the week. Um, I'll explain it. But uh, yeah, so we put together a sea perch ROV and uh, this is how it went. Hi, my name is Galen. I work for the Marine Education Center and today I'm bringing an ROV to my apartment pool so that we can test it out and see how it works. Step one is to go to the pool and lock your roommate out of the gate. This is the part where I tell you how everything works. Okay, so here's your sea perch, also known as the DIY ROV. It has these two pool noodles at the top for buoyancy and balance. It has three propellers, two on either side and one in the middle for depth. It has a mesh netting at the bottom and a frame made of PVC pipe. The PVC pipe is taped and sealed to prevent it from filling up with water. The green cords attach to your remote and the black wires and clamps attach to your battery. Your remote is this white cube that you can find in the box. It has two joysticks in the middle and then two knobs on the front to control depth. Your battery is this black box with a red terminal and a black terminal. You're going to clamp the red clamp onto the red terminal and the black clamp onto the black terminal. So after you connect your green cord into the remote and your clamps onto the terminals of your battery, your ROV is ready to launch. If you're lucky enough, you'll find a random kid's toy at the pool and then you can use it as an obstacle for your ROV. That's all I got. Thanks for watching. Okay, so, um, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, that's what it looks like to drive one of the sea perches. Um, and Honestly, all the students that are going to be operating those are <laughs> way more skilled than I am at driving them. Um, but, you know, that comes with practice. So, yeah, students will actually practice with these. Um, they'll go out to their own pools or to public pools, right, and um, kind of set up their own personal obstacles and then be able to, um, yeah, practice and try to win the whole competition. So, um the University of Southern Mississippi School of Ocean Science and Engineering. Um, that's a mouthful, right? So you usually just say SOS. Um, and these are going to be all of our different campuses. So in Hancock County, we have the Department of Marine Science. So this is where um, I think, yeah, three out of our five speakers from this week are um, in the Department of Marine Science over here. Um, and so this is going to be where a lot of graduate students are going to take classes if they're trying to um, or if they're majoring in marine science for their master's degree or their PhD. Um, and then in Gulfport, we have the Marine Research Center or the MRC, and that is um, where they will have a lot of the engineering like the actual engineering stuff. So <laughs> they have a really cool setup there. Um, 
And this is kind of like the hub place for um, all of the School of Ocean Science and Engineering because it's not really easy to just get onto the STEMIS campus if we needed to for any reason. So um, it's like a halfway point between GCRL and STEMIS. Um, and so we can congregate there if we need to. Um, and so there's also Point Cadet, which is going to be um, a uh, docking station. So um, for our research vessels, right? And then also the Point Sur is going to be at the port of Gulfport. So um, that's where it is docked. Then we have GCRL Halstead. So this is in Jackson County, and this is going to be um, where we have a lot of our other graduate programs. Um, so if you were interested in like coastal science processes or anything like that, or some oceanography, um, that is going to be held at the Halstead campus. And that's also where we have our summer field program for college students who are majoring in marine biology. Um, if you come here during the summer, we have field courses that we offer and you are able to go out on research vessels and um, really just learn like what it's like to be a scientist like in the day to day. Um, so it's a great experience, super fun. Um, and even if you're from the coast, you should still do it because um, <laughs> it is a blast. Um, and then we have our Cedar Point campus and that's where the MEC is located. And also where we have a lot of some like our aquaculture, um, the TC Mac, um, building is there. So that's aquaculture. And then we also have like toxicology and stuff, um, other research that's being performed um, at the Cedar Point campus. So that's in the Gulf Islands National Seashore. So um, it's very, very pretty. And um, whenever we take some of our students out on boats and things will um, sometimes be coming out of the Cedar Point campus. So um, what do we have to offer as um, the School of Ocean Science and Engineering? So um, it's the leader of local, regional, national, and international marine science research. Um, so it focuses a lot on oceanic, academic, um, and just research overall. So we have graduate degrees in coastal sciences and marine science. We also have hydrography, so um, hydrographic science, if you're interested in that. Um, so mapping, right? And then also undergraduate degrees. So it's pretty unique that we have a marine science bachelor's degree. That's very, very rare. Um, so if you absolutely know that you want to pursue marine science, um, you could get your undergraduate in marine science, and that would be a head start above a lot of other people. Um, we also have a bachelor's degree for ocean engineering, which is novel. So that is very new. Um, and since ocean engineering is such a growing field right now, if you got your bachelor's degree in ocean engineering, you would also be um, ahead of the game. So if you're certain about your future and those types of things, which nobody is certain about their future, but if you know what you want to do for your career, um, for sure, get this undergraduate degree in marine science or ocean engineering. And then we also have some certificates. So the unmanned maritime systems program. This is basically for those of you who have already graduated from college or have already started your career um, and you're just now realizing that you want to work with the ocean and with ocean engineering, this program is for you. Um, so it doesn't matter how old you are or what you're doing, um, but you can take this certif uh, certification and learn all about um, ocean engineering. And this is offered at the Marine Resource Center um, and actually our speaker for later on today, Rich Delgado uh, runs this program. So if you have any questions about it, for sure you can contact him um, after he gives his talk. And so these are just our research vessels that we have. So um, what do you think is our largest one? What is the name of the largest USM research vessel? Um, Jim Franks, Hermes, Monroe, La Point Sur, which one's the biggest? <laughs> 
some variation in our answers. So we had one answer for the Jim Franks, one answer for Hermes, and one answer for the Monroe. And we had four for the point, sir. Four, good job, you four, whoever you are. Um, the point, sir, is the largest at this current moment in time. Um, so it is 135 feet. The Jim Franks is about 50 feet. Um, it's a catamaran, it's made of aluminum. Um, and the Jim Franks is what we go out on whenever we go sharking um, or if we go deep sea fishing for our angler camp. The Monroe, I've never been on the Monroe, um, but I've heard great things about it. I'm not sure how large it is. Um, the Hermes is retired. So the Hermes used to be the boat that we would go out on for deep sea fishing um, before we had the Franks, but the Hermes um, is retired now. And uh, we are welcoming soon the Gilbert R. Mason. So that is going to be 199 feet long. So if you are interested in ocean engineering, here's a whole list of jobs that you could pursue. Um, you could be an oceanographer and study the four principles that we are talking about today. You could also work in ocean exploration, be a marine archeologist. Um, lots of people don't know that there are such things as marine archeologists, but there are. Um, Petroleum engineering could also work with ocean science, environmental engineering, civil engineering, structural, um, harbor engineering, naval architects, academic professors, um, or you could always work on the boat. If you want to be um, on the boat crew, you can be a deckhand or a first mate um, and then work your way up to captain if you get enough hours at sea. Um, you could also work with navigating, telling us where we need to go, right? Um, and then you could be a research scientist. So the people who are um, going out on the cruises for specific reasons and um, collecting data. You could also be a scuba diver. So um, if you're interested in that and want to make a career out of diving, you could be a scientific diver or you could be an underwater welder, which is um, also an option. And then you could also work for the state or for the federal government. So you could work with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration or NOAA. You could work with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management or the Navy. Um, and then you could also work with any type of local government agencies or nonprofits. Um, so there's tons of options for things to do here. Uh, and it's all very fascinating. And it's cool to just be a part of the team in some way. Um, it doesn't even, you know, you could, you could be doing something completely different, right? You could be an academic professor um, and, you know, you meet an underwater welder and it's like you have stuff in common already. So um, it's pretty cool how it works. So our speaker for today um, is the coordinator of the Unmanned Maritime Systems Program. He is also um, at the Department of Marine Science and he got his bachelor's degree from Iowa State University in Meteorology. Um, he went to Naval Postgraduate School um, for physical oceanography and then um, got his master's degree from the University of Southern Mississippi in hydrography. Um, so if you're interested in hydrography at all, definitely ask him some questions. He's been with the USM for um, 18 months and he now works with the Unmanned Maritime System. And he is going to be talking to us about ocean robotics, um, in science and engineering. So these are just some of the topics that he's gonna cover in there. Um, ocean engineering in general, jobs in the field, maritime systems, um, our programs that we offer with USM SOS, and then also um, autonomous vehicles. So his name is Rich Delgado, and he will be working with us at three o'clock. So please join us um, at three, if you would like to hear about all of these fascinating things. And I am available for questions if you have any. Um, so starting now, what's the difference between an AUV and an ROV? Okay, let's back up my slides. Oh, there's um, the Gilbert R. Mason. Um, this is the boat that we are building now. 199 feet, everybody. Okay, don't yell at me, computer. Okay, let's go back. Um, so here's the ROV. The ROV um, is going to be tethered to the boat. So if you watch this here, um, it is connected and the people are going to be controlling it from those 
big shipment containers that we talked about. Um, and so they're going to basically be manipulating the ROV in real time, like actively right there, um, driving it. And if it needs to reach out and grab something or collect a sample, the people on the ship are going to be telling it to move this arm here or scoot to the left or, you know, things like that. Um, the AUVs are going to be a little bit more independent. And so these guys kind of look like a torpedo, right? Um, you just launch it into the water and nobody is telling it what to do while it is on its mission. So while it's on its mission, it is just going to be um, automatically doing um, the certain tasks. So um, it's going to be checking the water quality and then also um, looking at the ocean floor and scanning for different topography. Um, and it is going to be pretty much performing all of these things um, automatically because it has been programmed to do that. Um, so it's like basically as if it's been set up already and you just press go and then it does it. Um, so it's a little bit different from the ROV. The ROV needs more um, investment like immediately like while you're using it. So I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Let's see. Anybody have any questions? Okay, well, if that is it, then um, I will go ahead and stop my screen sharing and I will sign off. Um, so we will see you back here at three o'clock for Rich Delgado's talk on ocean engineering. So um, please join us and uh, we hope to see you then. So thanks guys. Hi everyone, welcome back to day three of our Blue Planet virtual summer camp. Um, so we talked a little bit about ocean engineering in our last lesson at one o'clock. Um, and we're going to continue on that same theme and talk a little bit more in detail uh, about ocean engineering and some of the particular tools and technologies that are used in today's field. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Apollo and Sadie and Laura for being here. Um, we are just excited to be talking about this and that you're here to learn with us and uh, yeah, just figure out more about the field. So we are joined with today um, Captain Rich Delgado and uh, he works with the Marine Resource Center um, and he is uh, the coordinator for the USM Unmanned Maritime Systems uh, certific or certification. And um, he is here to talk to us a little bit more about science and engineering and robotics. So thank you Rich for joining us and um, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Great. Thanks, Galen. And uh, always a, a pleasure to, uh, to do these events. Uh, I always uh, am excited to talk um, with uh, the future of our, uh, of our nation and uh, the future of our, um, you know, of our community, the future of our uh, University of Southern Mississippi. So this is a privilege for me. And uh, I, I, I'm going to cover uh, really just kind of introduce myself. Uh, I'll talk a little bit how, how I uh, became uh, interested and involved with uh, ocean oceanography and uh, in the sciences of things and then the engineering that uh, accompanies that and um, I'll, I'll try to give you a couple key points along the way that will then go into uh, later slides about the vehicles that we use here at University of Southern Mississippi to do research and uh, and I'll go talk specifically about them and what they do uh, and uh, talk about the facility where I work uh, that uh, is cutting edge, state of the art, and it really is uh, a, a facility that I wish uh, we could uh, take a tour of together uh, today, uh, you know, in, in a normal camp or at least uh, having, um, you, know, uh, you know, a lot of pictures. But uh, in, the, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll show you a, a couple pictures and, uh, and talk about the facility. And then I'll open it up for questions. 
so that's our agenda. Uh, I'll try to keep it lively and, uh, you know, put uh, a lot of, you know, what we call in the Navy sea stories, you know, things that, uh, you know, what uh, the experiences that I've had that uh, try to make them interesting. Um, I know we'll do questions at the end. Uh, and if you would chat those in the Q&A or, or otherwise, um, that that's the way we'll do it. So I'll just keep pressing forward and then we'll do questions at the end. So with that, let's talk about ocean robotics and uh, Rich Delgado. So uh, uh, that's me in the upper left, or excuse me, upper right, uh, most recent picture with the University of Southern Miss. Uh, and as you can see, uh, I've, uh, you know, I've worn many uniforms along the way. And now on the over, lower left, that's my daughter uh, back in, I think that was 2004. Or um, when you're, um, what, what led me into, you know, oceanography is um, really, it's, it's not where I grew up because I grew up in Minnesota. Uh, never saw the ocean until I was 18. Um, the, the, you know, Jacques Cousteau, uh, you know, it was, uh, it really was a, a realization that uh, I majored in meteorology when I was an undergraduate at Iowa State University. And when I got uh, into the Navy and joined the Navy to, uh, you know, to be able to expand my horizons, get to experience a lot of things, serve my country. Uh, it, it was once I got in the Navy that I realized that the weather and, and you know, the, the, the atmosphere and the ocean are, um, behave physically a lot the same. Um, they're both fluids, right? Air is a fluid in terms of uh, its dynamics, as, as is the ocean. So um, they, they behave in many of the same ways. You can set up numerical models uh, you know, that, uh, to analyze what the, the current state of the atmosphere of the ocean is, and then you can use math uh, and you know, differential equations to uh, to derive what the predicted future, something, to, you know, in future time, what the ocean and atmosphere are going to, how they're going to change. And that's, that's pretty amazing. And uh, I can say, uh, having done this now for about 30 years, um, the accuracy and the skill of numerical models and the oceanographers and scientists, uh, computer engineers, the uh, ocean engineers that build uh, the numerical models, for instance, and the sensors, and we'll talk about this uh, more in our slides, the sensors that feed into those models um, have come a long way in skill. Watch TV when a hurricane is coming into town. Uh, you, hear, you hear about, you know, what's the model say, you know, and the, those, those spaghetti diagrams and all the different computer model solutions to what we think the storm's going to do um, that that is science and engineering in practice and uh, you know it's uh, it's it's a pretty remarkable system so uh, you know my experience as a navy oceanographer um, it was took me to a lot of different places um, i worked uh, on both coasts i worked overseas uh, one of my highlights there is in the lower uh, center is, uh, you know, visiting the National Hurricane Center at, in, in Miami. And, you know, one of the things that Navy oceanographers do is take a weather forecast and tailor it, uh, make it specific to what Navy, Navy operations might be going on at sea and on shore. So we do weather forecasting for ships, uh, airplanes, submarines, and shore stations, you know, um, bases, Navy bases around the world. So that was exciting. Um, certainly, you you realize that you know there is uncertainty in numerical modeling, uncertainty in observations, and you apply science, math pr principles to uncertainty. You know, uh, you know, an example that I can give you is, um, you know, when you see the weather forecast. You know what? What does a thirty percent chance of rain really mean versus an eighty percent chance of rain? You know, there's there's math and uh, science behind all that, and it 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 you know it it was exciting for me to be able to 
influence Navy decisions. You know, should a ship stay in port or go out to sea to ride out a hurricane? And, and doing those things in, in a way where you're taking the science and the engineering and applying it to this, you know, operational decisions uh, was a big part of what I did. So uh, down there in the lower right uh, is a picture of me with a uh, ocean glider. Okay, that's a commercial system. Uh, they cost about $150,000. And you know, what is an ocean glider? An ocean glider is a uh, instrument there you see. It's, it has a temperature and salinity or you know, how much salt is in the water. Uh, those sensors are on that uh, system and there can be other things like dissolved oxygen that, you know, that fish rely on. Different types of sensors on that, that large uh, yellow you know, operating uh, unit there. And that, that technology is pretty unique because if you look at the back, um, you know, you see the, the control surface. What you don't see is pro a propeller. Okay, so uh, how does this thing move in the, in the, in the ocean? And uh, it's pretty, pretty unique and pretty ingenious. That system actually uh, will, will sink itself. It will take in water and pump out water to change its buoyancy. Um, it can computer controlled. It, uh, it's pretty simple design, honestly. Um, and it will take in water, basically uh, flood itself and it will start to you know, uh, descend in the water column, start to sink in the water, and it will pick up momentum. Gravity will pull it down into the ocean, and then at a program time, as a, as a glider pilot has programmed the system, it will pump out that water and become positively buoyant to float back up to the surface. It happens very slowly. Um, you know, these things move at, uh, on a good day, you know, half a mile an hour, uh, it, you know, uh, and it, it, it takes on the order of uh, six or seven hours, depending on the depth of the water. But it's important that it's going slow because it's measuring that temperature and salinity and other profiles in the water column, which is very expensive to, uh, with a ship. And you're only getting one place at one time when you dip something over the side, the same sensors over the side of a ship. So the engineering and the science that goes into building and operating that sensor is, uh, is remarkable. And when you have a number of these in, a, uh, uh, in an area, you can really provide the right information to that computer model uh, to, to make it accurate. And uh, one of the, the, the largest contributors to uncertainty in a uh, weather model or an ocean model is how much data, you know, actual measurements are available to the model to for its its first uh, for its analysis for its uh, you know its times zero uh, forecast. So um, so those gliders like that are actually out in the Gulf of Mexico as we speak uh, with uh, NOAA with the National Oceanic uh, Administrative uh, Administration, uh, one of their agencies, and they are collecting um, that temperature profile so that that data can be fed ultimately to the National Hurricane Center, because if you're not aware, a hurricane gets its energy actually from the ocean. Uh, it, is, it, it, it relies on hot ocean water uh, to, to, to provide the heat uh, for convection and for thunderstorms that ultimately drive a hurricane. So if you can measure that heat content accurately, you can get a better uh, uh, forecast from the numerical model. And so these ocean gliders are in the Gulf of Mexico sending that data. And, uh, you know, it was, you know, this year with crystal ball, right, um, was forecasted pretty well. Um, it was the strength of the surge was a little, un, was un, uh, under forecast, but the, the wind direction and the, or the, the direction of the storm and the strength of the wind was uh, was was well forecast, and it's because of sensors like these and good numerical models. So um, that's an example of an unmanned system that uh, that the university has. The you know many other uh, universities and companies and the and the Navy have gliders like that. Um, what else? Yeah, you know I, I joined the Navy when I, I left uh, when I graduated from high school. Uh, 17 days after high school, I went to uh, uh, basic training in San Diego, California, 
and uh, it's it's true what they say. Time does go quick, and uh, I was I was very blessed to uh, be able to serve our country and, and experience a lot of great things. Um, one of the most gratifying things uh, that not just in the Navy, but uh, to go to sea, uh, to be on a ship at sea. Um, those of you that may have done a, like a cruise ship, um, you know, that's that, that counts, uh, I would say, but certainly doing that on, um, in, a, in a work environment where you can go out, um, can, you know, really experience what Mother Nature has in far as um, sea state, uh, the weather at sea, uh, you know, what the winds and waves, um, one of the most amazing things that uh, that I've ever seen is, um, you know, a, a moon, no moon and a clear night and being able to see stars very brightly from horizon to horizon all around. Um, it's, it's just unbelievable. Uh, life at sea is uh, the most gratifying thing that I've done, but it's also the most demanding. And uh, certainly being away from loved ones is, is, is part of that demand. Um, but you, 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 you make your ships, professional relationships at sea that, uh, that last a lifetime. And, and I was fortunate enough to have that opportunity. Um, been to six of the seven continents, uh, did, never made it to Antarctica, but uh, been to six of the seven continents uh, because of the time I've had at sea. So with that, we'll next slide. And I want to start um, specifically what we do at University of Southern Miss um, and what, you know, you as a uh, potential student, I uh, hope you come to the University of Southern Miss and uh, I can see your picture uh, on this, or put your picture on this slide someday. So um, as Galen mentioned, uh, we have an education programs re with respect to unmanned uh, systems and I'll, I'll call them ocean robots. Uh, unmanned maritime systems gets to be a, a mouthful, but uh, you can see some pictures here of action of uh, students that have gone through our five week undergraduate program uh, to learn to operate unmanned ocean, ro ocean robots. And in the upper left, you can see uh, our class and they're holding some handheld uh, or man portable uh, underwater vehicles. Uh, those are a brand name of, uh, by Riptide. And uh, they, they are a great training platform. The, the students take them apart, put them back together, and then we go uh, put them in the tank that's in the lower center there, uh, test them, and then take them out in the ocean and, uh, and run them. Um, and so, you know, you may ask yourself, well, what, what, what do you use an ocean robot for? Well, I covered a little bit with the ocean glider in the previous slide. These are propelled um, those those uh, red pink systems and then that large yellow system on the back of the boat at the top center um, those are propelled systems those are you know have a, a propeller uh, like a boat and uh, they're battery operated and uh, they have different uh, you know uh, capacities for going to depth the the one the yellow one is called an Iver and that can go down to about 200 meters depth so about 600 feet that's very deep uh, because um, for every 33 feet, um, the pressure equals one atmosphere. So, you know, it, it, it is very pressure, uh, high pressure environment to operate those depths. So when you operate these systems, you have to really know um, the oceanography and the engineering to make sure that it operates correctly. And more importantly, you get it back, you know, that, uh, that vehicle that's, uh, you know, that Iber vehicle is about, uh, in its current configuration, is just about a million dollars. And actually, I'm sorry, about $850,000. That's a lot of money. And, uh, you know, unlike an aerial vehicle that, uh, you know, uh, aerial drone that goes out and flies, and, and if you have a problem, it, uh, it, it, it may crash, unfortunately. Uh, but chances are you're going to find it. Uh, it'll probably not be in one piece or many, many pieces. But you know, you, you may be able to figure out what happened and maybe even re uh, salvage it. When you're talking about ocean underwater ocean uh, sensors and, and vehicles, uh, you know, if something goes wrong, you may not get it back. So you know, operators and researchers really have to know what they're doing, have redundancy, and uh, you know, be able to do buoyancy correctly, be able to control the vehicle correctly, 
understand battery operations, uh, understand the, uh, you know, how do you position the, the, you know, know where the thing is at and, you know, program it properly to, to drive uh, where you want it to uh, and do the, uh, you know, the ocean sensing or, um, you know, the, the yellow one has a payload bay and to put something in the surf zone. So being able to operate that payload bay correctly. So that's engineering, right? Engineering by which you are, you know, solving a problem, uh, coming up with, uh, you know, uh, solutions that take in, you know, you know, in the lab uh, before you go out and do trial and error, uh, you know, reducing the errors, you, you want to, you know, do it right, preferably the first time and, and it worked to what you designed it to do. So uh, this education class uh, has been running for about uh, for three years now. We're going to have another class in the fall and uh, it's really popular. One of the most popular activities is what you see in the on the right side and the, the, the lower center right. Um, each of the students is given a toolbox with a bunch of parts and over the course of the five weeks they build their own glider kit. Okay so same same idea as that yellow glider I showed you in the previous this slide. This is um, is, a, is is basically inside that tube is a syringe that does the same thing. It's it's remotely operated with a, a small infrared remote, and the students do all the wiring. They do all the uh, the, the end caps are actually three D printed. They make the little wings. Um, there's a uh, you know a computer chip. They do the the, the computer uh, simple coding on that computer chip to to be able to receive the operator. Uh, commands on the remote and they'll build it and at the end of the course we put it in our tank that you see there and they'll fly it they'll you know they'll hit the command and it will sink it'll get momentum they'll hit another command and it'll pump out that water through us you know it's a, basically a, a computer controlled syringe on the inside of that pretty pretty cool um, but it, you know it's obviously you, you know you're you're learning the fundamentals of engineering you know, you, they learn about, you know, watertight integrity, buoyancy, um, you know, counterweighting, uh, corrosion, um, uh, and, uh, you know, the things associated with engineering. On the science side, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, the temperature of the water will affect the, the rate at which the, the, the vehicle goes up and down, uh, for instance. Uh, wind waves, and, you know, How's, how's that glider affected by the wind? So that's, you know, it's, it's a really exciting or pop and popular activity in the course. And uh, we, we look forward to having another, another go at it here uh, this fall. And I hope you all uh, can attend this someday because it's a really, you know, unmanned systems, I like to say from time to time is, uh, it, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's analogous to maybe not a cell phone, but along those lines, you know, uh, unmanned systems are going to be a, a, a matter of uh, common practice, um, you know, uh, uh, in our lives. Uh, Self-driving cars, uh, you know, unmanned systems already are delivering mail and delivering packages. Um, you know, you could tend, you could contend that a, you know, that what what happens with a, uh, you know, when a when a vehicle um, is on uh, cruise control. That's really, you know, it's, it's man, but it's, you know, when you, when you start talking about automation and then autonomy, that's, that's when unmanned systems uh, really gets interesting. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, so next slide is, next slide, there we go. So here are uh, pictures of the systems that we have at the university. Uh, these are all owned by the university and we do research and education programs with these. I'll just briefly talk about each of them so that you get a kind of a feel of what, what, they might, uh, what they may be used for. Uh, I'll start on the left side and that Iver is the one, same one that we saw on the back of the boat in the previous slide. Um, we, are doing a grant with the uh, with the Marine Corps, U.S. Marine Corps, actually, to you know do those that payload section. Um, so underneath the forward part of that vehicle is a 
built up a small container that will open in half and drop something like an ocean sensor or a listening device in the in the surf zone and then um, extract the vehicle will leave the sensor and go off and return to back to base. Um, that's much easier said than done and doing that in a reliable way uh, and you know for the system to uh, uh, you know just the buoyancy you know if you drop something off the uh, you know off the vehicle the, the weight and distribution of that weight on the vehicle changes significantly and so uh, you don't want to you know the, the vehicle to sink or come back up to the surface unexpectedly so being able to compensate for that change in weight and uh, uh, on the vehicle is an engineering challenge. So we're, we're doing that right now. Uh, the center is a system called Mola Mola. Uh, that is a, a pretty unique system. Uh, that is a deep water system. It can go down to 2,500 meters. So uh, like 7,500 feet and it, uh, I'm sorry, 2,000 meters. Uh, so 6,000 feet. So very, very deep um, rated to very high pressures, but it, um, it's not a fast system. You can see it's got a lot of a lot of friction, uh, you know, flow friction uh, with its design, but it's based on that twin hull design. It's very stable, and so we use that to go down and with cameras, and uh, you know, still cameras and video cameras to take pictures of things of interest, uh, whether that be a shipwreck, uh, you know, uh, underwater uh, plants, underwater grasses, and so forth, and other things that are of interest. Uh, uh, Eagle Ray, the one to the left, uh, which is the, the more torpedo looking uh, system there, that's your traditional autonomous underwater vehicle, an AUV. And that's also a deep water vehicle uh, that can go down to about same depth, about 2000 meters. What's special about that one is it has a high, very high resolution ocean mapping system uh, where it can go down and uh, take both uh, uh, acoustic pictures, you know, sonar pictures of the bottom, but also uh, do what's called multi-beam echo sounder, which is a uh, basically making a map of the uh, deep water, you know, deep water sea bottom and, and bringing that data back so that you can have a, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a picture um, that looks like a, you know, a mountain map, like a topo, a topo, topology map. So that, those two systems, Mola Mola and Eagle Ray, are very capable, especially when they operate, um, you know, on the same mission. Because you can go out and find things with Eagle Ray, and then go down and take very good pictures and video with Mola Mola. The last system on this slide is the one on the right, and that's a, that's a, a autonomous surface vessel, an ASV, and this is a, a system. This is about five meters long, so about 15 feet long. And it's a boat. It's uh, essentially an unmanned boat that is controlled, uh, either programmed to do a certain um, uh, profile, you know, go out and drive certain uh, locations uh, uh, with GPS, or can be operated from uh, remotely from a, a control station on another boat or ashore. And this system has uh, what's called a, hydro a hydrographic suite of sensors. Um, and if you're, if you ever go out to sea, um, you know, what the, what the, a sea captain or, a, you know, a ship's crew has to have is ability to, to navigate and to navigate, they have to know what the, you know, what the map is. And, uh, that's called a nautical chart. And on that nautical chart, you will have, uh, depths of the water and positions of aids to navigations like, you know, buoys or nav aids. Or and also hazards to navigation where a, where an underground shipwreck might be a rock. So this unmanned surface vehicle, this ASV, um, has the sensors to do that and the GPS, uh, high accuracy GPS, to be able to position where those depths and features are at. So we are doing testing for NOAA uh, that uh, allows us to you know integrate different systems and operate that system or operate that boat in a uh, uh, autonomous way. So let's let's talk about autonomy a little bit. Um, you know, when you think about a, uh, when you think about a, uh, a Roomba vacuum cleaner, 
Okay, that Roomba vacuum cleaner that you, you know, when you leave in the morning and there you or your folks turn it on and it starts going around and it basically, um, you know, has a, uh, a an IR, a, a little light sensor and it will go across the room until it senses with light that it's about to hit something and it will either hit it or stop and then turn and go to another direction. Is that autonomous or is that an automated? It's, technically it's semi-autonomous, okay? Because it's not doing something that, it's, it's not on a programmed path, right? It's not like you, you know the operator said, okay, go this direction for three feet and then this direction for three feet and so forth. It is going in a you know semi-random way uh, on a path until it gets to something, uh, uh, detects that something, and then changes direction. So that's that's semi-autonomous. If it was truly autonomous, uh, it would um, it would not only sense that 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 direction, but it would understand. Have I already covered other areas um, in my where I'm going to go next? and be able to make decisions um, more than just a basic, you know, collision, you know, uh, object avoidance, it will make decisions, smart decisions to, uh, to cover areas that it hasn't already done, for example. So this autonomous surface vessel uh, here is, you know, one of the research areas is it, it's autonomy is very tough to do reliably and safely. And so, you know, for a cert ASV to, uh, you know, let's say it's out there, you know, uh, running survey lines, which are parallel lines, you know, this space such that it's doing coverage of the ocean bottom with its sonar. What happens if that ASV um, comes close to a, you know, a fishing boat and has to stop, maneuver and make a decision to keep on going, turn direction or do something else? Um, that logic and the computer systems, the algorithms that go into that are, are, are complex, honestly. And uh, doing that in a reliable way and different conditions is a lot of research what we do. Okay. So that's, again, a lot of science, a lot of engineering that uh, is captured with uh, these systems. You know, when and I didn't mention this earlier, you know, what... Ocean engineering program at, at uh, University of Southern Mississippi uh, is a uh, only one of the six in the, in the nation, and it really is a, a unique engineering discipline because it, it, it actually captures computer engineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, in a way that uh, you know for a specific applications, whether it be shipbuilding or ship. Um, you know, ocean going uh, vessels, uh, unmanned systems, uh, oil platforms and oil, you know, oil industry technologies. Um, so it's it, ocean engineering covers a, a variety of just, you, know, uh, you know, commercial and defense industries. So let's go to the next slide and I'll talk about the Marine Research Center. This is where I work, it's down in Gulfport. It's a great place to work because it's brand new um, or almost brand new now. It's built in uh, 2018 and we have uh, the ship, the Point Sur in the upper right that's based uh, at the pier nearby. And uh, that ocean gozing vessel uh, is uh, you know, a workhorse for the university and can get out to see the Gulf of Mexico is, 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 is right there at Gulfport. And we use the Point Sur and there's also the Jim Franks is another vessel that's not based at Point uh, at, uh, Gulfport, but over at uh, Point Cadet near Biloxi. And uh, uh, there's other vessels the university has, but we do, you know, it's really doing the, the research for aquaculture, you know, uh, ocean farming, uh, fisheries management, uh, physical oceanography, like, uh, you know, sediment, you know, how sand and, uh, you know, particulates in the water are, are moving, or uh, you know those types of things. You know, one of the most recent examples is the effects of the uh, you know the Mississippi River spillway openings in Louisiana. What's the effect on the Mississippi Sound? 
everything from oysters to you know water clarity to you know the sediment the sands moving uh, along the coast and 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 silting in uh, the uh, the channel getting into the port so those um, you know a lot a lot of important things happen at the Marine Research Center. And uh, it's right there uh, next to Highway 90. And I, I hope you can come visit sometime. Uh, we do have uh, ve the vehicles that I showed you on the previous page uh, are based there. Uh, one other vehicle that I'll talk about in the, in the lower left um, near the center, that's with the yellow top. That's what's called an, a remotely operated vehicle. Okay, so what's the difference between that and when you see in the lower left? Um, a remotely operated vehicle, it has uh, a tether. Um, it has a, you know, basically a cable that to a ship or to a, uh, you know, a, a, another uh, uh, piece of apparatus in between the ship and the ROV that um, provides power, uh, lifts it up and down in the water column. Um, but an ROV serves a great purpose because it's tethered, you can pass a lot of data back and forth. You can know where it's at, get it back very easily. Um, and these things can go very, very deep. Um, ROVs have been down to the deepest depths of the ocean, uh, which is uh, you know, um, over by Guam, uh, the Challenger Deep, and uh, you know where the pressures are extremely, extremely high. And, uh, and these will have propulsion, electric and uh, hydraulic propulsion systems to maneuver them. If you ever seen the movie Titanic, you know, where they're taking pictures of the sunken ship, uh, that's all done with the ROVs. And there's one that's, uh, uh, that's based at uh, the Marine Research Center. Okay, so I'm almost done here. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, I wanted to show a little bit, you know, hey, what's the roadmap to becoming an ocean engineer? And you can see across the top uh, some of the, you know, the, the aptitude, skills, and knowledge uh, kind of giving, you know, what, 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 do we, what do we seek when we become an ocean engineer or an oceanographer for that matter. And you can see in the middle yellow is the, the courses that uh, the university provides uh, in the ocean engineering. And then, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, you know wh how you gain the experience um, and apply those aptitude, skills, and knowledge to uh, you know, to really round out your um, you know an ocean engineer's um, skill set. So um, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Certainly, if there are specific qu questions, uh, you can see that uh, perseverance is underlined. Um, that's perseverance in, in a number of ways. You know, it's you know, anytime you talk about science and engineering, it's, uh, you know, it's, it is intense. Um, you know, the, the, the level of uh, aptitude and the level of hard work, but it's also the, you know, with hard work and, and uh, comes great reward and uh, being able to operate and design and operate systems in these environments is very gratifying, very, very gratifying and be able to solve problems you know, uh, I've seen unmanned systems that, uh, unmanned vehicles that can go out uh, and respond to an oil spill, uh, you know, and be able to collect water, detect that if there's a, a dangerous level of oil and water, um, and then, you know, provide that, that information so that, you know, the right cleanup uh, measures can be taken um, and do that very quickly rather than, you know, uh, getting a boat out there and putting people at risk, um, putting them in danger of uh, an oil spill uh, uh, area. So that's that's pretty good example of an ocean engineer and oceanography that's associated with it. Okay, and that is my presentation. Uh, I want to open it up for questions. Thank you for um, your presentation. It was very good and very thorough. Um, let me see. We have we have a question. Um, it says, how far can the ASV go from its control center? Yeah, very good question. And <clears throat> the short answer is a line of sight. Okay, and so line of sight means uh, there the antennas on the 
the vessel have to be able to um, see either radar signals or light signals, it's, 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 uh, radio signals, excuse me, and at sea, generally, uh, line of sight, depending on the height of the antennas, is about 15, 15 miles or less, um, depending, on, again, on the, the, of, the height of the antennas. So uh, that's pretty far at sea, uh, 15 miles. If you were looking on a ship, you know, on a, on a boat, let's say like a fishing boat, um, and you see the horizon, it's about, it's about you know, 12 to 13 miles. So... Um, that's, you know, that's the visible horizon. Um, again, depending, the higher you are, the further out you can see, but uh, that this kind of gives you the, um, you know, stints. That's, that's pretty far for, to have a vessel operating by itself and not, you know, not being able to respond. So generally when we're doing research, we want to be a little, you know, closer than that. And, uh, you know, the chase boats that are with the, are attending, attending vessel that's with the, the ASV is, is generally within a, a mile or two uh, at most, but they, they could go further. You know, one of the things that, you know, as the technology matures, um, you know, we want, we want systems that are robust, smart enough, reliable enough to do these things without having to bring another boat out there. You really don't gain much if you're, you know, having to send this on really don't solve anything right you're, you're not saving time and energy um, now that said you could have a an unmanned system operating with a a manned boat and you're, you're covering more area that's called you know force multiplier or you know uh, you know the teaming unmanned systems teaming where you're getting more coverage than you would with uh with uh you know two uh, a one boat alone and you're saving some people on the second boat. Uh, so that that's that's a force multiplication factor. But ultimately, you want your unmanned system to do things uh, what we call in the business dull, dirty, and dangerous uh, by themselves. Okay, so that you know if there's something that's really dangerous or really dull, um, or really dirty, um, you know, like uh, you know, sending an ROV uh, or untethered. Uh, you know, an un, untethered system that can go down and weld a oil platform, um, you know, way down so you don't have to put a diver in the water. And, and, you know, that's dangerous stuff. And having an unmanned system be able to do that, that reliably um, and, and make decisions, much easier said than done, but that's, that's the goal, right? So that um, you, can, you can keep the people uh, more focused on, the, the, you know, the smarter things. Good question. Thank you. He had a second question. Um, what ships were you on in the Navy? Yes, uh, that's a great question. And every every sailor likes to talk about the ships they're on. Um, so I've I was on three types of ships. Uh, two of them were aircraft carriers. So uh, I've done, I've been on a helicopter aircraft carrier and in the Navy. Um, uh, when you when you talk about helicopter aircraft carriers, that's related with the Marines. Um, U.S. Marines and the Navy have been partners uh, since their inception uh, back in the you know 1775, and so you have Marines um, that will uh, use helicopters to fly ashore and, and do their missions. And um, so I was on a helicopter carrier uh, had about 1,600 uh, troops on board, or 800 Marines, 800 Navy crew, and uh, we had about 30 craft. And uh, so that was my first ship uh, back in 1995. Um, that ship was pretty old at the time. It's it's no longer around. Uh, it was used for target practice back in uh, 2005, and it was sunk by a tor torpedo in Hawaii. So <laughs> uh, I can't say that I, I have. Uh, you can go out and see it. You can Google it, obviously. That was the USS New Orleans, which has a namesake, obviously uh, pertinent to, to living down here. Uh, the next ship I was on was the USS Theodore Roosevelt, uh, which is one of the current active aircraft carriers. Uh, fortunately, it's been in the news here having problems with the virus uh, with the crew, but uh, they, they're behind that now. Uh, so I was on the aircraft carrier Theodore Roosevelt 
for a short time back in 2003. Um, and uh, did a lot of uh, air aviation operations, you know, um, aircraft carrier. It's about four acres uh, on top of a flight deck uh, that can land and take off air, you know, jets, uh, F-18s and other jets uh, simultaneously. Um, it's, a, it's a remarkable feat of engineering and uh, it's really a, you know, one of our national uh, resources or excuse me, na national assets, um, what they call a capital ship. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal and uh, really um, you know important part of our our national defense so uh, the third type of ship i was on was called a cruiser uh, that that's a, a large surface combatant ship uh, and uh, i was on the uss anzio and the the cruiser is a multi-mission ship it'll do everything from um, you know being able to con control the, the uh, you know waterways you know being able to escort uh, tanker ships so that they're safe. Um, that's one of the missions that we were involved with where you're, you're just escorting a commercial ship through a waterway so that uh, it doesn't get harassed or shot at or something like that. Um, and then uh, it also was an air defense uh, system or an air defense asset for a carrier. Okay, so that make it, the carrier will focus on landing and, air, uh, landing and taking off aircraft, but you'll have a surface ships around it to protect the carrier from getting uh, a missile or a aircraft uh, attack or, or submarine attack against that aircraft carrier. So you'll have a cruiser and some destroyers around the, uh, the carrier. So that was a lot of fun. Um, one quick sea story. You know, you really get an appreciation at sea of the power of, of mother nature. And uh, um, usually when I, you know, when I'm face to face with students, I'll ask, you know, who's ever been at sea uh, in sea state, you know, in, in, in ocean waves. And, you know, and, um, you know, a lot of people say, yeah, I've been out on the fishing boat and, you, you know, you get out in the seas and maybe, you know, three, four feet. And then for a small boat like that, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty, you know, what we call sporty. Uh, um, you know, you might get uh, the people who start get seasick and uh, other things like that. But when you're on big ships, um, you know, sea states of uh, like eight feet, um, you know, that's from crest to a trough. You know that's that's uh, eight feet. That's that's getting it's getting a little better. You know, you can still ride pretty good depending on the ship size. But uh, you know, the Navy works hard to keep ships out of 12 feet or greater. Um, and uh, when I was on the cruiser Anzio, uh, long story short is we did not avoid the high seas, and we were in uh, 18 foot seas, and we were going pretty. Uh, we had to get somewhere, and we were going pretty fast. Uh, we were going. You know, the ship was put, uh, going. And about 18, 20 knots, which is, you know, 25, 26 miles an hour, which is very fast at sea, um, especially in that sea state. And the ship, you know, if you've ever been a surfer or you've ever been out in the, on the waves, um, you know, uh, large swells, you know, those large rolling waves, that, not the wind waves, the, the choppy stuff, but the large swells, uh, they come in sets. Uh, it's, it's interesting how nature, you know, they'll come, you know, one or two, at a, two or three at a time, and then it'll calm down for a little bit. And then It'll, it'll come another set. Surfers know this because, and they'll, you know, they'll try to, you know, let the first, the first one go by knowing that the second and third one are going to be even better. So anyway, at, in open water, um, those swells uh, will come in sets as well. And uh, so when I was on the Anzio, uh, we got in that sea state and it was right, you know, we're going right into it and the ship would get kind of a resonance, right? It would go up, down, and up, up a little higher, and then and crash down up and down well by the time you get to the third one you know a lot of momentum in the in the ship's bow and uh we were going in um we were you know it was so uh high that the the bow of the ship um and this is about you know 40 50 feet off the water line was submerging into the ocean it was basically the the, the, the bow of the ship was going underwater and the whole ship would just shudder um, cause it's basically hitting the wall, um, and the water would just, you know, what we call green water would come over the, over the bow, flood the bow spray would, you know, come on the windows of the bridge. Um, and the, the whole ship is, uh, is literally shaking, uh, when that, and that's not a good day. Um, that's when stuff breaks. 
and that's when you are, are, are saying your prayers that you, you hope that the ship keeps running, uh, you know, electrical power. You know, this is in the middle, middle of the Atlantic in, uh, in February, in a long 10 hours. And we did that. It's not like you do it once or twice. You did it for hours on end until the weather passed and we got out of it. But uh, that, that gave me an appreciation of, uh, of Mother Nature and the power of the Mother Nature. And, you know, man does a lot of things to uh, try to control, yeah, not control nature, but, you know, be able to operate in different conditions. But uh, Mother Nature always has a say uh, in, in, in whatever you do in the environment. And uh, we want to respect it and be able to, uh, to do it right and keep people safe. Good question. What else? I had a question. Um, I was wondering who you traditionally like work with, like where, what is the data um, for that you are usually collecting with these equipments? Yeah. Um, so the data, um, it's, it, it falls into two categories generally. It's the, you know, things about the ocean column, you know, the temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, some other things, and then the, the ocean bottom. Okay, what's the, what's the depth? What's the composition of the bottom? You know, is it sand, rock, those types of things? So those two categories are really what, you know, for even on the surface vessels, um, they'll measure the, the water, you know, uh, the ASV, the, the, the surface vessel I showed you, actually has a, a winch that can drop down on a cable, a, a probe that will measure the temperature and salinity and so forth. Um, surface vessels are also also used for um, being able to detect other other sh other uh, vessels, um, you know, radar, uh, cameras, stuff like that. So the data is uh, you know is is in those two categories are used for a variety of things, um, mostly for um, modeling, uh, you know, numerical modeling. Um, be able to put that information into those numerical models that I mentioned, so that you can forecast the future. Uh, or uh, analyze, you know, for instance, uh, the ocean mapping of a hey, where's the sand at right now and how is it changing so that you can, uh, you know, have a, you know, uh, have a, a better understanding of how an ocean, uh, a, a channel into a, into a port is, is going to change or how often it has to be dredged, for instance. So that's, uh, you know, how that data is used. Um, what else? Um, you know, on the, on the biological side, uh, you can, you know, how a, uh, how a fisheries or how an oyster, um, you know, uh, area, you know, one of the, uh, one of the, not an unmanned vehicle, but an autonomous unmanned system that we're currently researching is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very labor intensive um, to, to, to tend to oysters. Uh, you know, you'll have an oyster cage that has to be flipped or put in a certain height in the water column for temperature and, and salt. And doing that takes a lot of labor, uh, a lot of effort. But if you had a system that could sense, an autonomous system that could sense uh, the oyster's uh, needs and be able to, um, you know, to flip or move up and down the water column, that would save a lot of, you know, a lot of effort and backbreaking <laughs> effort. So we're doing a research project to do that, that very thing. And um, um, that's, that's autonomy. Uh, doesn't have, you know, unmanned doesn't mean it's necessarily always a vehicle, if that makes sense. So does that answer your question? Yeah, um, I was wondering, is it like mostly with USM scientists or like, are you going to be working with any scientists outside of USM? Yeah, uh, yeah the uh, both. Um, the, the research that we're involved with, uh, has has sponsors, and those sponsors range everything from um, the uh, NOAA's um, Office of Exploration of Research. Um, so they're they're interested in the ocean, the ocean dynamics. You know what the ocean uh, temperature, salinity. You know what uh, what all those things, and and the National Weather Service that I talked about earlier. So that's that's one sponsor. Um, we have uh, a sponsor that we work with is the Army's. Um, uh, Army Corps of Engineers Research Lab up in Vicksburg, and they use unmanned systems for mapping um, and also for uh, that sediment transfer. 
so that they can build better bridges, um, better uh, port structures that are going to withstand different conditions uh, longer and better. So that's another sponsor of ours. We have another sponsor, which is Department of, Department of Homeland Defense um, so, and the Coast Guard. And, uh, you know, having a, sail, a, a solar powered sailboat that is unmanned that can uh, see and see and hear something. So let's say you have a, a, a solar powered sailboat that is operating off the coast uh, that might be able to detect a, you know, a very, very fast boat that's at night. Not doing anything, you know, tell shore, the, op the, the, the operation center ashore, hey, there's something out here, you need to come check it out. That, that means you have a sentinel out at sea that is out there for weeks at, at a time, for instance, or, or many, many days, so that you don't have to have a, a manned vessel doing that, patrolling. You can have an unmanned system that is, or a network of systems that's listening, watching, um, and uh, and then can can raise the flag, you know, uh, send a signal back shore. That's another sponsor of, of research that we're doing right now. Do we have any other questions for Rich? All right, looks like that's it. Well, thank you so much for um, your presentation and all of uh, the information you've provided. Um, I, I always learn a lot from you. Um, so I'm really grateful that you were able to join us for Blue Planet um, both weeks. And thank you to all of our participants for joining us as well. Um, I hope you've gained something from being here. Um, and I also hope that you come back tomorrow. Uh, we have our chemical oceanography lesson um, at one o'clock and Dr. Chris Hayes will be with us um, to talk about what he does with his research um, in marine chemistry. So thank you all for being here and we will see you again tomorrow. All right. To thank the top. You. To the top. <laughs> thank you, Emma.